This episode is brought to you by the continuing education courses in the Neurodiversity University. From individual study at home access to a district-wide program for all your educators, the courses from Emily Kircher Morris can be used to fulfill CE requirements. Go to neurodiversity.university or click the link in the show notes for more information. Look, there are some kids who would say, I want to sit in a room by myself and I'm fine, thank you very much. And they might feel fine, except what they're not realizing is everyone else is moving on. Everyone else is making friends. And when they kind of wake up and come out of their room, there's not going to be people for them. Friendships and social connections are fundamental to our well-being. But for neurodivergent individuals, navigating these waters might be challenging. How do neurodivergent friendships differ from others? And what hurdles must be overcome? How does rejection sensitivity dysphoria or a different trajectory of social development impact neurodivergent relationships? Caroline McGuire, the author of Why Will No One Play With Me, is here today and we'll explore practical strategies for enhancing social connections and fostering meaningful relationships for neurodivergent people of all ages. That's straight ahead on episode 214. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. You may not realize that we have a Facebook group just for our podcast listeners. It's a great group with lots of helpful feedback from other neurodivergent people and people who love and support the neurodivergent people in their lives. I've always been really grateful for the support that our group members give to each other. If you'd like to join our Facebook group and be part of the positive conversations that are happening over there, you can head on over and search for the Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group on Facebook. We will put a link in the show notes, and we'd love to see you there. Okay, Caroline McGuire is here next. When I found the Neurodiversity Podcast, I was really kind of... Desperate to learn about myself and understand myself. Honestly, I wanted to find... Like a tribe who I could relate to and feel like I fit in. This podcast brings on guests who seem to be moving neurodiversity more into the mainstream. And Emily Kircher Morris is amazing. I feel like she's talking straight to me. Her knowledge about people who think differently is so refreshing. Everyone's different. And the world needs to understand them. And that's what the Neurodiversity Podcast is doing. Helping them understand us. 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 Today, I'm talking to Caroline McGuire. Caroline has a master's degree in education specializing in social and emotional learning, and she is also the author of the book, Why Will No One Play With Me? Caroline, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so happy to be here. So we're going to talk about friendships for neurodivergent people of all ages, kids and and adults. Um, And I thought maybe a good place to start our conversation would be to talk a little bit about how and why neurodivergent friendships might look different than other types of friendships and relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just actually producing something for, for this spring last night, and I was reading some studies. And One of the things that comes up a lot, I think many of us experience, which is that because of our executive function, which is the management system of the brain, weaknesses, as kids, we don't have the best skills or maybe we're immature. And then we don't play as much and we don't play with as many kids. We don't practice our social skills as much because we're not played with as much. And therefore, we don't have as much friendship-making experience. And then we have these bad feelings about it because it didn't go well. We have all this sort of stuff we carry with us, some negative self-talk. And so it becomes this cycle where as we are trying to make friends throughout our lifespan, we have all these feelings about it and maybe not enough practice. Mm. Um, and executive function controls everything you do. It drives every behavior in your, in your body. And we have 
lags in executive function. And so because of that, there are skills that are not as easy for us. And in most cases, kids with ADHD don't get any help. Mm -hmm. Like the school system doesn't help them. And parents traditionally haven't known what to do. And that's kind of how I got started. There was no one talking about this 18 years ago. I mean, not a single soul. And I was like, why is no one talking about this? Why is no one noticing this? Because I felt like this was the thing everyone wants. Everyone wants friends. Yeah. Actually, when you were giving the first example about that accumulation of experience with social relationships, it reminds me of, have you heard that study like in Canada, they studied the the kids who go on and play professional hockey. And if you backtrack it, basically, they're the kids who are the oldest in their age group. So then they play and then they get more playing time and then they get to the more elite teams. And so then they just have all of this accumulated experience that then helps them be really adept at this particular skill but the kids who who don't, don't have that. And that's kind of what you're saying there about, about that experience. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about, I think, social relationships, especially as it relates to autistic individuals and autistic kids, um, but not so much with, with ADHD, even though probably there are, there are as many or just different. What would you say? Like, how are the, the comparisons there either the same or different between, you know, ADHD types of friendships, especially when kids are young versus autistic relationships? I think what has happened is that, you know, research shows that um, the the numbers of kids who have friendship struggles with ADHD is staggering. I think the difference is that if you have other learning struggles that are acute when you are little, you get identified, you get helped. And then what's happened with certain things is there's a pathway. Right. Educators say, oh, we identify this. Here's a pathway and let's move forward. If you don't have a pathway, which ADHD has not. We have a lot of friendship struggles, but we haven't had that identification, that pathway. Um, And I think a lot of autistic adults that I work with and talk to have had a hard time and in some cases been abused or been treated really badly in those social learning situations. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's hard either way, but I think the ADHD kids also, in some cases, you know, I saw on your, on your website and things, you know, that the gifted kids, the 2E kids, mm-hmm. you know, they're so... <laughs> easy to miss. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's just so much misinformation. I mean, even this week, I had a student and the school's writing me and the school's saying, well, you know, they're so gifted. And I'm like, like, who cares? (laughs) Right? Like, I mean, like, yeah, mazel tov. It's great. They are gifted. That's not what I'm writing you about. That's not what we're trying to hash out. We're trying to hash out the learning disabilities and the things that needed help. I think a lot of times, you know, one of the reasons I think people don't believe in ADHD is that they see us as like, oh, well, you can do this when you're interested. Mm -hmm. And they don't get all the things that we really struggle with. That, it's almost like the magic of what we can do is what they focus on, not, okay, but here's all the other areas where I am really struggling. It's hard to see it on the surface level. It's not always as obvious. And so many of the things that are characteristics of that are attributed to things like being careless, being disorganized, which, you know, when you boil it down, the common (laughs) refrain is, well, if you just tried harder, you know, or if if you just tried something different. And that really is, um, it prevents people from getting, I think, the support that they need. And I think like there's been this stereotype, you know, a lot of the research, I actually just met with a researcher uh, to hire for my next book, you know, a PhD person, and he'll help me with the research. And (laughs) I said, where are all the studies about adult social skills, you know? And he was like, there aren't any, (laughs) you know, there's barely any. And so part of it is like, we've focused on sort of, you know, a certain population to study, a certain population to focus on, and it's folks who get into trouble, 
folks who have more outward behaviors, but there's also something important to say for those folks. They also didn't get help with social Mm -hmm. because people assumed a degree of willpower. Like they just need to stop alienating people Mm -hmm. instead of understanding that they would do that if they could. Right. It would make sense. I mean, it's like there's something, there's, there's a gap there. There's something that's missing. Right. I think there's also this this entire conversation related to rejection sensitivity dysphoria, especially related to ADHDers. Oh, yeah. For what it's worth, I think a lot of neurodivergent people can relate to the experience of having really intense reactions to feeling like they've been excluded or someone is upset with them. So I'm wondering if you can share some ways to think about those types of social hurts um, and what can help, whether it's kids or adults, get through some of those really hard feelings. Definitely. I mean, I was bullied pretty badly. It's kind of a matter of public record because I talked about it in Why Will No One Play With Me, and I talked about it more uh, this year. And one of the things that that I find is that there needs to be an awareness because sometimes it's not a slight, it's a perceived slight. But because we have rejection sensitivity and because we're aware of what's happened in the past, we have these voices in our head and we go very quickly into fight, flight, or freeze. And so I think we have to have strategies for our rumination. I think we have to have strategies for the fight, flight, or freeze. Because in that moment, I can't sort of say, well, is this true? Like, you know, what's the evidence that this person has actually slighted me? I, I'm, I'm gone. I'm into that. I can't come back. So I think you have to have strategies. And I love to have those strategies be something that you do all the time so that it's not like you have to remember. Because in that moment, like, I'm not really connected to my thinking self. The other piece, too, is that I think it's really, really, really important to hear those voices in your head and have replacement thoughts and to build your self-confidence because um, there's always that young person inside you. They're there all the time. Um, I'll tell you a personal story. (laughs) The other day, I had something really good happen about something I had been struggling with, something I've been trying to accomplish. And I was cleaning the kitchen counter and the voice in my head said, oh, you got picked. And I was like, I am 48 years old. And this is not the thought I want to be thinking because, no, you just finally overcame a hurdle and you got an opportunity. But there was this part of me, right, like that had evidently been feeling that rejection sensitivity. And I knew it. But when I heard that voice in my head, I was like, oh, gosh. So I think we have to replace those thoughts and we have to honor them and know that they're there because it's there for most of us, you know, and we can't never have relationships because of what happened in the past. But if you don't know that it's affecting you, then it is going to affect your mindset, your relationships. Totally. The example I, I think of when we're talking about this, so, you know, as a as a mental health clinician, I started my practice, and I remember when I would first have even clients, and we'd have some sessions, and, like, it just kind of happens. There's attrition, like, and, you know, maybe things are going okay, or, the, or you know, it's, it's not in the budget, or there are insurance changes, or who knows whatever the situation is. And when I first started, I used to take that really, really personally. What did I do? I did something wrong. I'm not a good therapist. They don't like me. All of these fears. And eventually where I came to was like being really aware of those thoughts and then replacing them and saying, my go-to response now is like, they must be doing really well. Like they must be, you know, feel like they, they don't need this right now and that's okay. Or it wasn't a good fit. They're not ready for this. And there may be times when I truly <laughs> have messed something up. I mean, but also that's not useful for me to like dwell on that and ruminate on it right. is kind of the point, you know, to try to reframe it. It's about the stories we tell ourselves about those experiences that really influences how we move forward. You know, one of the things I talked about in Jessica McCabe's book, I, I co-wrote the chapter on how to people. And one of the things I, I talked about a lot that I think is under discussed in our community is I think a lot of us have a lot of stories and that we have mindsets. And those mindsets completely come from childhood, from things that have happened, like totally validated. 
But those mindsets don't help us socially. Like one is scarcity. Got to take anything that comes to the door. Yes. I can't reject this friend. I don't have many friends. I hear this all the time. I can't say no to this person. This person doesn't treat me well, but I don't have a lot of friends, you know? And I totally want to say I understand where this comes from. But then everything you do, you approach with that mindset. And the mindset doesn't serve us because we are we are awesome. We are great. We are fabulous. We are funny. We are all the creativity in the world. And we have maybe some skills to work on, but everybody's working on something. Mm-hmm. But because of childhood, we come in feeling like I'm not as good. I got to take whatever I'm served up. And so part of what I think happens with the rejection sensitivity is like that, I think, dovetails with those mindsets. I think those mindsets really are closely associated with our rejection sensitivity. And, you know, when you're a little kid, you're like, I don't understand why no one plays with me. And you develop these thoughts. I must be less than, Mm -hmm. you know, or here I am once again, you know, left behind. So I got to take whatever I can get. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's not true. We can, we can make things better so that you don't, I don't want people to tolerate friends who aren't good to them. No friends might be better than bad friends, right. <laughs> perhaps in the long run. I don't know. I mean, you know, that would be such a hard boundary to set if you realize like, okay, well, then that means maybe I don't have many friends at all. But, um, but at the same time, it might be in some cases healthier. It's really hard to tease that out, I bet. I think so. But I also think that if we are tolerating these, let's say, toxic friends, then we're not open to making new friends who might treat us well. Mm, Good point. And so I think the healthier we become, the more we do the work and the more we use our superpower, which is high interest, Mm -hmm. right? We have lots of interest. If we join things with people who have shared interest, part of friendship is this thing where you have these shared interests, you bond and you share experiences. Then we have more opportunities. Then we're not as stuck in saying, well, this is all I've got. I'm stuck here. Mm -hmm. And we get to have fun, which is, you know, wonderful. We get to be with people like us. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. At the Neurodiversity University, we're committed to elevating the classroom by helping educators learn neurodiversity-affirming practices. The courses, which are taught by Emily Kircher Morris, are a combination of videos, printable documents, and quizzes that will help you hone your skills. We cover subjects like recognizing and accommodating dyslexic students, contouring curriculum for gifted or twice exceptional minds, identifying and accommodating students with dysgraphia or dyscalculia, helping autistic or ADHD learners harness their strengths in the classroom, or using AI and fandom to help develop coping skills. You can pick and choose the modules that fit your needs. The courses can be used to fulfill your continuing education requirements or just for general professional development. Parents, our modules can help you understand how educators are meeting your kids' needs and give you ideas on how to advocate for them. Check the link in the show notes to learn more. Like our podcast, the university is a division of the Neurodiversity Alliance. It can be really hard for us as adults, whether we're parents or teachers, to see kids who are really struggling with some of those social relationships. They're trying to find those relationships that they want and that they feel comfortable with. But I do think there's also this layer of this where sometimes we as adults project our own expectations onto kids based on our own past experiences or or whatever it might be. And so we feel like, oh, they must be unfulfilled because their friendships don't look like what we might expect. And sometimes kids will tell us that they're fine, but... (laughs) But we might think that they're just saying that. So how do we help kind of tease out what types of social relationships kids might really want or need based on their own neurotype and their own socialization style? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I get this all the time because I think, look, there are some kids who would say, I want to sit in a room by myself and I'm fine. Thank you very much. And they might feel fine, except what they're not realizing is, Everyone else is moving on. Everyone else is making friends. And when they kind of wake up and come out of their room, there's not going to be people for them. So sometimes as parents, we have to say, how about middle ground, Mm -hmm. you know? 
But on the other hand, I think we have to ask kids what they want. No one does, but I think it's really important to do that. And I think it's important to have these conversations. People don't talk about friendship and relationships enough, but here's a hack for parents, not in an inappropriate way, but just talking about different kinds of friendships you have, how there are all these different kinds of relationships in the world, how there are levels of relationships. I'm closer to someone else. Someone is just my yoga buddy. You open the door to talking about these things and you make it part of the fabric of your family. So it's not taboo. It's not the elephant in the room. It's not something that's not discussed. And now that the kid is lonely, now you're actually bridging into this topic. And they're like, where is this coming from? And they get really defensive as teenagers. And I think that with kids, everyone needs to have friendship. So they don't have to have 30 million friends if they're an introvert or they're not interested, but they do have to have a few friends and they have to do things with them. And one of the things that happens with us is that we underinvest in friendships. We kind of forget out of sight, out of mind. And so if I'm a parent, one of the things I would encourage is creating that infrastructure, creating activities, places, their routines where they see people so that they're keeping up their friendships without it being dependent on their executive function. And so that even if they're a kid who says, oh, I'm, I'm good, I'm fine by myself, they aren't really by themselves because every Saturday they, you know, go do such and such. And it can be It doesn't have to be sports. It can be something they love to do, but then they have their friends that they see. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure, I think, is the easiest way to do that because now it's a routine and it's not me nagging you to text someone. Yeah. So whether that's scouts maybe or Pokemon Club, whatever it is, you know, interests are so important for really having those shared social experiences. And at school, you're in a class with however many other kids, who were born within a 365-day window around your birthday, whatever that might be, and that's just who you're with. But there's no guarantee, especially if you have some quirky interests or some different things that you're into, that you're really going to be able to have that same shared interest that's such a vital ingredient for those relationships. And I think that infrastructure that you're talking about, I like that word, for parents, like finding those opportunities where they can be with like-minded peers who have similar interests, even if there's some age variation there, is probably one of the ways that they can build some of the most authentic relationships and friendships that they might have. Absolutely. And if you talk to, you know, kids who have friendships that continue from, you know, kindergarten to senior year, usually there's some um, fabric, right? There's some way that they see those people and they're together. I think we can't push one agenda, right? If their special interest is Legos, there's a Lego club. If their special interest is Pokemon, there's a Pokemon club. If they go to special interest activities, they're going to meet kids who are like-minded. You know, if, if I were queen, I would have everybody do activities when they're young because it's much harder to insert those activities into you know, a 17-year-old's life. I do it, but it's a much more of an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. And so I think having those activities, um, it also makes it their interest. They're with people who they are interested in, but it's also something that is their interest. So they'll they'll fight you less because Mm -hmm. they're like, oh, I do want to go to robotics because I do enjoy building the robot. There's not as much anxiety going into like a totally unfamiliar situation. It's like, I know what this is about. I know I enjoy this as opposed to trying to start something brand new. It's really hard for kids, especially if there's any little bit of that anxiety or whatever might be inhibiting them. Yeah. Whenever I hear resistance from a kid, the way I hear it is usually lagging skills. So when even when a kid says, I'm fine, I like being by myself, leave me alone, If I were you, parents, I would try to hear it as lagging skills. The it's such a this thing about friendship with with us being neurodivergent. It's such a hard topic. It almost feels like so hard. I don't want to go there, Mm. right? So when you're talking to a kid who's had a hard time, I think it's really important to remember that and to remember it just 
is so hard. I just don't want to talk about it. And that's why they're resistant. And so the biggest tip I have is build your relationship with them. And when you talk, don't do it in the way that it's like, we're going to sit down and we're going to have a big talk. Do it doing something they love. If they're playing video games, play with them. And then they're more likely to talk about this with you. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about those kids who really do want those interactions and, and more friendships. But like you said, they're lagging in some of those skills, but also in the confidence that they really need to build those relationships. How can we support building that confidence so that they can develop the friendships that they really would like to have? I think confidence is such an under-discussed piece, and I love that you brought this up because I think confidence is so key. You need confidence to launch. You need confidence to do anything you're doing. Um, We're asking them to do stuff out of their comfort zone, which requires confidence. So I, I think this is a piece that I think people forget about. Um, and whenever I talk to folks who did have social skills help and, and maybe it wasn't the best, maybe it was, you know, downright awful, a lot of them will say, but I didn't have any confidence and no one really cared about my perspective. And that was the missing piece. Um, to build confidence, one of the things I believe is that I think everyone needs to do something they are good at every day. Mm. Um, you have to be in your house of strength every day. So it might not be what you as a parent love or value, but if it gives them confidence, then I want them doing it. The other trick I have is to have them catalog their wins as they enter a social situation. And this is just literally, it could be, I got here, I'm, I'm talking to people, I am in, you know, I'm in the room. It doesn't have to be like they go and they like are, you know, the life of the party. They're literally, the win can just be, I showed up. Mm -hmm. But I want to, one of the things I do with my clients is I say to them, like, as you enter, say things like, I'm here. I got here. I showed up. This was hard for me. And I did it. To try to reinforce a more positive voice about the steps they're taking to try to build that confidence. Yeah, it's it's a switch from I felt really nervous doing that thing to I did the thing. Like it's just it's like it's it's a both and as opposed to because because even if they do those things but they don't focus like you said on the wins, then they just hyper focus maybe on the things that didn't go perfectly or the things that, you know, were hard about it, which then prevents them from maybe attempting that again in the future. Yeah. And I think there's something we forget, which is that for a lot of our kids, this is really, really hard. And a lot of times parents will tell me what they asked of their kid. And I'm like, that's an epic ask. You're you're talking about an introverted, you know, kid who's, who's never done this before, who doesn't ever leave their room. And you're asking them to go text a random person in their class that they like that they've barely spoken to. Like, let's say that out loud, (laughs) right? So I think the, my win thing is really to that so often what the kids are saying to me, what the adults are saying to me is I should have done this. I should have Mm -hmm. been chatting more. I should have, no, 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 no. These are micro baby steps that we're taking. We're talking about small things you did and that you celebrate because I think that's part of this narrative that we have as ADDers and as neurodivergent folks where like society or parents or somebody has put it in our head that like we have to do these huge steps and then it feels too daunting. We're talking tiny steps. You know, with a lot of kids, I'll say, I want you to add to a conversation in class twice today. That's it. And by that, I mean, you could even raise your hand and make a comment, not like you're going to walk across the hall to a group of kids you've never met and talk to them. You know, I want to ask you about um, something that I think a lot of parents struggle with with their kids, which is trying to figure out where online friendships fit within this context of relationships and what the value is there I think there's just a real generational divide for parents and kids, um, just as far as what those relationships look like. But I'm curious about your perspective on on those types of friendships that are primarily online. So I know that kids 
now have online friendship. I know adults have online friendship, Mm -hmm. but I want them to have both. And I want them to have both because I think that being able to make friends in person is a piece of fulfilling ourselves and having those important connections that we know affect our health and well-being. And there are studies that have come out that show that online friendship does not fulfill your well-being in the same way. Mm. With that said, I think a lot of this is about balance. A lot of kids find their people online or they're more comfortable online. So one of the things I often do is help them bridge from what is it about online that you like How are you able to be more yourself? Like, tell me about what goes on for you. And I really explore with them, okay, how can we translate that to some in-person friendship, some activities where you feel comfortable? Because part of online is it's easier to read the room. Mm -hmm. It's easier to figure out the social norms. I mean, kids have told me this. This isn't something I invented. And it's easier to be your full authentic self. You're not typecast, right? You're new and emerging. Um, It's just easier, I think. So I think that they tend toward that. I think a lot of kids play online and do things together. And I think we have to find balance. To just say no online friendships, I think it's their backup and then they don't like it. Yeah, it's it's a little bit more controlled for some kids where it's a little bit easier For example, especially when it's not necessarily voice chat, but if it's text based, like you can really think about how do I want to respond to this? You know, whereas sometimes in in in-person relationships, it's a little bit it's a little bit harder to pace the conversation or whatever that might be um, in a way that you feel comfortable with. Yeah. And I, you know, I'll never forget years ago, I had a client who um, started meeting people online who had a special interest she had. And she had so much fun and she enjoyed it. And that's part of the coaching method is to use questions and not say, yeah, but, but to just ask about what, what does this do for you? And part of what came out was she felt such joy. And I was kind of like, what if you could feel that joy in person? Right. And sometimes them having a positive experience online gives them enough confidence to where I can get them to think about in person. But I don't want to also have people say, well, she doesn't get it. They spend all their time on video games. They never see live people. I do get it. And I do not want them to just have online. I want them to have both. And I do get that some of them cling to online and they won't even discuss in person. I don't want parents to say, well, she doesn't get it. I do get it. It's just... The, the way I have found forward is to talk to them about the online and not ban it and not talk down about it. Mm-hmm. Because the minute I talk down, then they close off and say, oh, my, my, def- my deflector shield is up. You don't get it. You're going to tell me to give it up. And they don't want to give it up. Yeah. Caroline, I'm really glad that we've had this chance to talk today. Um, but as we wrap up, I have one last question for you. Sure. If you had a parent who came to you and they were just really worried um, because their child is telling them that they're really feeling lonely and that they want more friendships, what would you tell them? Like, what's the one starting point piece of advice that you would share with them? I think I would start with the special interest. I would start with, um, you know, this happens all, I mean, people write me every day that their kids are lonely or that they're lonely. Um, And I would say that finding your people is really about finding a place where people share experiences. I also would say that in many cases, um, you have to build their self-confidence parallel or even before they try to make more friends. And that's about having them do something that they're good at every day. I love that. Caroline McGuire, author of Why Will No One Play With Me. Thanks so much for talking to me today. Thanks for having me. Developing relationships can leave us feeling vulnerable. 
And making the decision to put ourselves out there can feel scarier than staying safe, even if we feel lonely or isolated if we don't. Neurodivergent people of all ages can start to feel like there just aren't any people out there who get them if they've never had the chance to find their people before. What do neurodivergent people, from kids to adults, want from their relationships? The answer isn't the same for everyone, but giving space for exploring what feels comfortable and opportunities to find people we click with is an important part of building those connections. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. See you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the continuing education courses in the Neurodiversity University. Go to neurodiversity.university or click the link in the show notes for more information. Thanks again to Caroline McGuire. It really was a helpful conversation. If you'd like to learn more about her, look for her bio and links in the show notes. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our office manager and social media director is Krista Brown. I'm the executive producer, Dave Morris. For all of us, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.